Welcome once again to the Biz Life Podcast, coming to you live from UNR Extension, Small Business Education Program Studios in lovely Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here today with Carlos from the Latin Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you for being here. And today we're talking about a topic that's pretty interesting. And we have Adriana is going to be here with us talking about estate planning. Correct? Correct. And all the stuff you need to do right for business. So so let's talk about estate planning and business planning. Why is it necessary? Well, imagine that you die. And what, what's going to happen with your business after that? Mm-hmm. Who's going to run it? Who is going to inherit it? Uh, so that's what state planning for business covers. What is going to happen with your business if you die today? How does it go on or not go on? That's, That's the important stuff. Is. Continuation right. of your, your business mod on your business assets. Yeah, that, that's an important thing. You build a business and it takes, it takes your lifetime almost to build this. You give birth to this thing and you, uh, you create this. And then uh, what happens? Are you going to close it when you're, when you, when you're gone? Or if you're incapacitated or something of that nature, right? Right, yeah. And uh, yeah, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Adriana. So I'm in, traditionally I started doing immigration. I'm an immigration attorney and, and doing small business consulting. But one of the reasons why I started getting into state planning is because in my community, the Hispanic community, um, it's not really a subject that's talked about a lot. And so I had a lot of clients who were coming to me after the fact, after their husband had died, and mm-hmm. what do we do now? And now they're in the middle of this probate um, you know, action in court trying to figure out who's going to get what and people fighting. Yes. So that's when I realized I, you know, I really wanted to start doing this mostly to educate our, our community about the subject and how important it is to plan ahead. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people don't like talking about this. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. You see people every day. I think people don't like to talk about estate planning because it ultimately means you're dead, right? Right. And we don't like to talk about that sometimes. It's like life insurance. It's hard, to, it's hard to talk about life insurance, too. It's just kind of a similar situation. It is. And people actually, some people have this um, superstition that talking about it means you're bringing it on to mm-hmm. yourself. So if I plan, then that means... I'm planning on dying tomorrow. Exactly. And, and the reality is we have no control of when we die, but we do have control of what happens to our assets when we die mm-hmm. and how much easier the transition will be for our families if we have a plan. Absolutely. And also a, a, the point is that it's uh, two sides. is the ownership, who is going to get the ownership of the business, and the continu- continuity of the business. So who is going to be in place, doing do what, and as far uh, you promise to executive share the business, uh, to plan everything. Because if you don't do it, it's very costly. Am I correct? Yeah. It's very costly, and if you have partners, that can get even trickier. Mm-hmm. Because, um, you know, if you're married... We were talking about this earlier. If you're married, your spouse owns half of everything you, you own. own. Yeah. And so if you die and you have partners, well, now your partners are partners with your wife. Yeah. And if they don't have the money to buy her out, what's going to happen then? What? then? Right. Yeah. Or it can happen, you know, to your the other way around where, you know, another partner dies and you want to buy their share but you don't have the money. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, life insurance kicks in. They actually have specific insurance for that, for people to be able to purchase a company in case that they were to, you know, one of the partners dies, the insurance pays for their share. Absolutely. And this is, this is stuff that a lot of small business owners don't think about. Uh, Nevada, we're a community property state, which means if you are married, your spouse has legal right to half of whatever is yours. And if you pass away, they're entitled to all of it, right? Uh, uh, technically. Yeah, if they have children. If they have you know, children. Their children yeah. and their spouse. Um, but, you know, and, and the other caveat is unless they have, obviously, a, a prenup. Yes. That would do away with it. But 
Um, so you have to be really careful because you never know who you might end up in business with. Exactly. If yeah. you don't have a plan. Well, and it's it's true. Sometimes business partners will get together and there'll be five partners in the in the company, and a couple are married and a couple are almost married and one separated. It it that makes a really tricky situation when it comes to continuity and and, and estate planning as well. So yeah. definitely, we need attorneys for this stuff. Yes, you, know? you definitely do, and, and, and have a plan. I mean, there's there's nothing better than planning ahead for mm-hmm. all those situations. That, that's really great advice. Now, uh, Adriana mentioned the P word, probate. Probate. Yeah. What is probate? A lot of people have heard probate, but they don't understand what that means. So what, is, what does probate mean? So probate is basically going um, to a, it's called probate court before a judge, and they basically gather all the assets of the disease, and they decide who's going to get that. Now, if you have a will, you know, it's, it, it's better than not having anything, mm-hmm. but it's not the best because you still have to provide it to the judge and the judge has to give it validity. So the judge will decide, is this, was this a true document? Were they signed by their own will or were they forced into it? Is mm-hmm. this really their signature? And so... That, that's one probate action where it's just submitting the will to the judge and the judge decides whether it is a valid document. And then if it is and everything's fine with it, um, you know, the, your assets will be distributed according to the will. Um, the other problem with a will is that um, those actions are, are public information. Mm-hmm. So anybody can come and put a claim against it. And dispute it. And, and what that does it. is extend your probate time out. It, it extends the time. It extends the time before the property can be distributed. And um, you're going to spend money fighting it. Mm-hmm. Because if, you know, if I show up and say, oh, no, no, he promised me the house, you know, even if it's not true, mm-hmm. the family members have to fight that. Yeah. They have to prove that that's not true. Um, creditors can come, you know, and, and, and put claims. Anybody can lay a claim against yeah, the estate. It's a public, um, Record. it's a public hearing. Yes. And so, uh, the other time when you're in probate is when you don't have even a will. Mm-hmm. So that's when, you know, there was nothing. Now the court has to decide who the next of kin are and then distributes the property according to that. So, and this can take months. To yes. occur. Th- this is this is where it's very challenging because I've had situations in my own family where this has occurred, and what happens is um, not not only is it there's there may be a financial burden on the family because now the deceased party may have debt that they're servicing. They may own, uh, in, in our case, uh, the person that passed away uh, owned owned property, owned a car. Uh, owned a uh, a condo, and the condo could not be sold. No. They had money in their bank account to pay the mortgage. However, they couldn't access the bank account. They also couldn't access the email accounts that had passwords and to reset things. Like it was really a chore because there was no there was no will essentially, and there was no uh, living trust, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here in a little bit. But uh, some of these things. Um, and what it, what it does for the family, which is not good, is it extends out that mourning period. I mean, just probate. And in this case, I think it took nine, 10 months to get through the probate process before any of those assets were able to be distributed. So um, the children had to literally pay the bills of the deceased, even, you know, at a financial hardship, even though the deceased had money they could access, they couldn't get their hands on any of it. So... It makes it really difficult from just a uh, an emotional perspective, but also just a financial perspective with that. And also, if Definitely. I may, uh, the family school, uh, English is a second language, also don't understand the process. They don't exactly. understand all the uh, legal terms, and this is, is another problem on top of that problem. Mm-hmm. No, and, and the cost of it, I mean, to hire an attorney to do it, you know, it's usually it's a percentage of what the estate is worth. Um, and so it, it can become very difficult. And, um, you know, you mentioned about extending the mourning period. Sometimes um, people, because of their in mourning, they, they don't have the mind to, <coughs> to deal, deal with, with this. And then, you know, by the time they kind of start wanting to deal with it, it can be too late. Mm-hmm. And I did have a client who that happened to 
his wife passed away and he was so devastated. He didn't do anything, you know, and he was just depressed and didn't want to deal with anything. Well, by the time he came to us, his house was getting foreclosed, Mm -hmm. you know, and then it was like, you know, trying to fix the problem and and trying to stop the bleeding so that the house wouldn't get sold. And, you know, he, and it was the same situation. He couldn't access her bank account because you know, he, he hadn't done anything to prove that he was the next mm. of kin. Yeah, that's difficult. And, and so that's, you know, a big thing that I always tell my clients. It's not for you. It's for your loved ones mm-hmm. so that they don't have to deal with all your stuff. You know, they I mean, it's hard enough for what you have to go through with people, yes. you know, grieving the death. And now you have to deal with all these, you know, gathering their assets. What do they have? What don't they have? You know, where is yep. it? Who do they want it to go to? Yep. So it, it's definitely something that, you know, just let people grieve, you know, it, it's hard enough as it is. Yeah. So how do we avoid all that, Adriana? What do you recommend? So the best thing to do is having a trust. Uh, a trust is always the best um, because a trust, you're going to appoint someone who's going to serve as the trustee when you pass and they're going to distribute all the property however you decide. Okay. For those who, who aren't maybe not familiar with what uh, a trust is, maybe they've heard the word, oh, I have a family trust. I have this. W- what does that mean exactly? So I always, you know, to simplify it, I try to explain it to people. It's the same thing as the will. I mean, they're both documents, right? They're both documents that you're going to have prepared. The difference is um, with a trust is a fr- private document, and you already appoint someone to distribute your property instead of having to present the will to a judge and have the judge decide who's going to be in charge of mm-hmm. all that. You already have that. Gotcha. And because all of that, you've already stated how you want everything distributed. It's a notarized document. Um, it's something that it's a it's a private document that doesn't have to go through doesn't have to get published or be in court published or be anything. and no one will know about it and okay. just you and the person that you appointed and you can have either a family member or a friend a close friend that you trust or you can even hire someone outside there's companies that have trustees that mm-hmm. that's all they do is you know deal with um, with the trust people's a- and trust. also you can list all your assets right investments uh yes. partnerships and everything so People would know because when uh, when you don't have the trust or the will, when the f- family dies, uh, some don't know. Of the family, nobody knows nothing right. about investments or partnerships or, or money is out there or documents. Where are those documents? So the, on the trust, everything is lined up, secure. And, and I agree. Always I say you need to do it because it's when you have the security. Where you are there, your family is secure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and the other thing I tell people, too, is like a roadmap to your assets, right? Sure. You're giving them a roadmap. You're giving them, um, you know, where to look, where to go knock on doors um, for all of your property, you know. And, and okay. he's right. Some people have investment accounts. Some people have, you know, multiple bank accounts that their family might never even know, and that would be money that they would never get. So all that hard work, you know, that you want to leave some type of, legacy to your family, they might, it might not get to them. This is how you do it. These are tools that the ultra wealthy only had access to like 50 years ago. Right. I just want to say that because most people didn't have this or have access to this, but you have access to this now. I think the, you know, and maybe it's not that people didn't have access to it. I, I think in, in, from my point of view is that people believe that they need to be ultra wealthy. To need that. To need this. Okay. And the reality isn't that oh. in Nevada, anything over $25,000, it's going to go through probate. So, you know, I've heard a lot of clients come and say, well, I don't have anything. I just have my house. Well, that house is that worth over $25,000. Yeah. So for sure, you're going to be in probate. Um, the other thing that people don't know about um, real estate property is that if you don't have a trust, even if you have a will, if you have multiple properties in different states, you're going to have a probate action in each state. Each state. So Ouch. if you have a house in, in Utah, <laughs> yeah. if you Ouch. have a house in Utah, if you have a house that. in Arizona, now you're fighting, you know, you're having a probate action and, you know, it, it's costly for your family and it's, it's a headache because now you're going to have to be going back and forth. Yeah. 
So, so, uh, so the process of setting up a trust, that they make an appointment with an attorney, right? And you go and you talk about your assets and things like that. You form the trust, and then you transfer everything you own into this trust, yes. correct? Yes. And then if you become incapacitated or or you pass away, if you get in a car wreck, heaven forbid, or you, um, you just, you're, you're in a coma or something where you can't make your own decisions, there is a trustee of the trust, and it's typically your spouse if you're married, correct? Yes. Unless you otherwise designate. So what happens too is if, if a spouse suddenly dies, and I've, I've counseled a number of businesses where this has happened, and it's, it's a devastating thing just dealing with the emotions of it. However, it can be a lot worse if you don't have access to anything that the spouse had, right? And so what the trust enables the spouse to do is just simply pick up the pieces the next day and pick up where you left off at, uh, which is terrific. And I think one of the other benefits of a trust is let's say, um, let's say the person has children that maybe have some addiction issues, right? And maybe they have a million dollars in assets that if you just had a will, those get transferred to the next of kin eventually. And so you're going to be giving maybe a drug addicted son or daughter a chunk of money, which probably is not the best thing for them. So right. what a, you can do in a trust, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you could designate and say, hey, I know my, my kid has a, has a substance abuse problem. Um, as long as he comes in and pees in a cup and is good, he gets a check every month type of right. thing. So you can kind of distribute your funds as you want to, even after you're dead. It's right. a way for you to control so, how you're yeah, doing there's, that. Yeah, there's actually, you know, a lot of memes and jokes about um, – controlling your kids from the grave from the grave yeah and and that is one of the I mean you can have as many stipulations as you want you know I have a client right now who you know her kids aren't going in the right path and so she one of her stipulations is that her daughter before she will get a penny she has to volunteer for one year at Catholic Charities wow and after a year then she'll get part of it and then she'll have to continue to do, um, you know, volunteer work and, and show that she goes and helps the homeless and things like that. Yeah. So you can really dictate, you know, you can say if you, you know, if you graduate by from university by this age, then you get a bigger amount than if you don't graduate, you know, or if you grad- gotcha. graduate by this age. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, didn't know. I heard of a case where... Yes. Um, the father left money for his daughter as long as she was single by yes. the time she hit like 32 or something like that. And she happened to be married and I think came across this later on and she was going to inherit a bunch of money if she was single. And so she ended up divorcing her husband. <laughs> <laughs> now, Adriana, when you do the probate, you can change any time you want. May I correct the information on the probate? The trust. Uh, the trust, I'm sorry, I was thinking on the trust, you can make changes anytime, uh, anytime, anytime. So, yes. but you have control on it. So that's yes. the perspective we try to give to our, our audience, that they have control. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. You, you live in your house, everything's the same. Nothing really changes. I mean, the only thing that changes is the name. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you transfer the deed of your home, you transfer it to the trust name. Um, you can transfer your bank account into your trust name. Um, you know, but you have full access and there's no penalty. Like if you, if you sell the house and the house is no longer in the trust by the time you die, it just lapses, nothing happens with mm-hmm. it. And you can at any time change who you want the trustee to be. Um, you can change what you want to add to it or who your beneficiaries are going to be. The, the beneficiaries are the people who are going to inherit whatever your assets are. So it can be your kids. It could be yeah. a friend. It could be a charity. You know, some people, uh, I have another could be a dog do. too. Yes. It could be, oh yes. my God, Seriously. it could be a dog. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. I've seen it. Um, well, the first time I set up a trust, uh, my wife and I set one up about 20 years ago. And uh, we went in the attorney's office. We did all the work. We paid the money and everything. We were just going in to sign the final documents, right? And right, I signed mine. When she goes to sign her, she goes, wait a second. Uh, what if I die and he remarries somebody? And the attorney says, well, he's the trustee of the trust, so he'll get everything and be able to make the decisions how that goes. 
Hmm. I'd like to write a stipulation in there that says that it skips her and whatever kids and it goes to just our kids and this. And I'm like, really? We're doing this now? Wow. Seriously? Yeah. Like when we're signing, wow. you could have brought this up a week ago when we were planning this, you know? But uh, yeah. <laughs> so it, wow. it's, it's important to get this stuff right. And, yes. and that's good. So, well, moving on from trust, let's talk about business structuring, you know? It's very important how you structure a business. We have several different types of uh, management ownership structures. And uh, do you want to talk about some of that and what, what, what you recommend to your clients for that? Right. So generally, there are four types of structures that you could have. So the basic one would be a sole proprietor, which you don't really do anything. You just have your business and mm-hmm. it's your social and that's what you do. You go, I'm in business. Right. Yep. There's no paperwork, nothing. Um, There's also no liability protection because if you, you know, make any mistakes, whatever you do, it's you. Yep. You're the one being sued. Um, And then we have partnerships and that can be, you know, two people or more. And it could be two sole proprietors jointly sharing the liability, the liability, which isn't a happy (laughs) thing either. Right. No. (laughs) <laughs> I will say, no, <laughs> our audience need to understand what they, we say liable when they get to, meaning his house or her everything. house, money, everything they own there, they could be part of the process and they can lose everything. So that's the important. So it's not only to say I'm the only one. It's everything is on the table. Yeah. They right. can lose everything. Well, and it's like uh, partnerships like being married, Essentially, oh, without, with, without the sex, exactly right? Exactly. Like but um, you know, or like being oh, married. I don't know. <laughs> there, there might be some of that. There might be some of that too. Yeah, yeah. But but generally, depending um, on the partners. Depending on the, <laughs> there's partners and there's partners, right? But um, I've been involved in several different partnerships, and it's 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 when you have a great partnership, it's a great thing, right? And when you have a bad partnership, it's a it can be a very challenging thing on a daily basis, and sometimes great business partners are not good friends either. Right. You you may have this collaboration at work. You don't hang out after office hours. <laughs> you just, you, you understand each other and you work together and there's a yin yang process and that usually powers things, but you're not, you, you don't like each other for the most part. You're in business together for a purpose. Right. So, okay. So that's sole proprietorship and partnership. Right. And then, um, so now we could also have a LLC. Mm-hmm to say limited liability company. Okay. And the name says it all, right? It limits your liability. And it's not a corporation, so right? It's, it's not a corporation. Exactly. Yeah. It's a limited liability company. And so what happens with that is it's, it's considered actually a, like a separate person. It's a okay. different entity. Even if you were to get sued, they actually need their own attorneys because it's a separate entity. It's not you. So anything that you do, let's say you're a landscaper and you go to somebody's house and you cut a tree, tree branch and it lands on somebody's car. Now you owe them, you know, it landed on their um, Audi. Like Audi and now you owe them $100,000, you know, and they're going <laughs> to sue you. Yeah. Well, they can't come after your house. They can't come after your personal bank account. They can only come after whatever the LLC owns. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Now, there's a caveat to that. Live to fight another day. And that's a caveat to that. I always say, if you're following the formalities. Exactly. Because if if you just have this shell company and you don't really use it as a separate entity, then you're not two different things. You're the same. Exactly. So you must follow the formalities. And that's like, don't use the business bank account as your own personal account. That is the biggest Don't thing commingle that funds. people yes, yeah. do not Never. commingle funds, you know. Well, and I, I, I've used this example before. If you, have an, if you have employees, you should definitely not be a sole proprietorship, right? Oh, absolutely not. It, it, because when we're talking about entity structuring, we're talking about two major issues. And one is liability protection, and the second one is taxation. Tax. So those are the two things. So if let's say you have an employee, and they're driving a company vehicle and they hit a kid in a crosswalk oh. awful we don't want that to happen yes. right nope. um that's an unfortunate incident if it's an accident the company will probably be sued right uh for this now let's say if your driver happened to be drinking at the time of the accident okay now 
you know, there's liability that's going to be personally shared for that driver. I probably they're going to go after that driver for the one thing plus the company. Um, it's a whole nother level of negligence on the company. Now you're protected from these things as long as you're not negligent in doing something. So let's say you knew this employee had a drinking problem and you sense that they were drinking that day at work, but you let them go off and do it anyway. If that can be proven in court, you're going to be yeah, you're held. Done. Yeah, you're in trouble for that, <laughs> right? So there's there's different levels of, of liability. Liability protection comes from like accidents and things like that. Where it gets a little tricky is if you're a sole member corporation or a LLC, and you're the one actually providing the service to for the business. As if you can be negligent or be proved to be negligent, you can be in trouble on that sort of stuff too. So it's not to say you're not going to get sued, but it's what liability protection you do have. Right. I mean, in in anything, no matter what you do, if I mean, if there's if they show intent that you mm-hmm. meant to do that or you were deceiving people or something like that, I mean, there's very little that's going to protect yeah. you. But if you're just in the course of business, you're mm-hmm. just doing your work and accidents happen, then yep. you will be protected. Which we're is not great. talking about how to protect you if you committed fraud or how to protect you if you meant to hurt someone. Yeah. This is just, you're just going about your business. and It's one thing if you drive on a work site and your, your truck slips out of gear and rolls into a building, Correct. causes damage. It's another thing if you're driving towards a building and jump out the last second because you want to crash it, right? right? If you can prove uh, intent is, is a lot of that. So now we, we, we talk about corporations. Yes. So there's a C-Corp and then S-Corp. Usually the, the C-Corps are for more public entities. I mean, you know, if you're going to go sell shares of your company mm-hmm. and things like that, that's when you would want to have that. It's not really recommended for small business. The S Corp is recommended when you have employees, the W-2s, because then that way, uh, the way that it's taxed, Mm -hmm. it's more um, um, advantageous for the business. Exactly. And uh, so a C corporation pays its own taxes. It's form 1120. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't know. 1120. I'm not going to, I do not give, I, you know, Juan's giving me the nod. Yes, no that's tax it. advice yeah, from me. Yeah, so, so <laughs> Form 1120 for for a, a C Corp and S Corp's um, 1120S, right? Yeah, see, Juan got that. Yeah, that was a good thing. And if you have a partnership uh, or an LLC where there's more than one partner, uh, you, f- you do partnership return, which is Form 1065, right? Adriana, so, why, mm-hmm. as, why as a business owner, uh, why I need to, ch- well, what is the best option? I start a business. I probably will make $100,000 a year. What will be the best entity? Uh, uh, S Corporation or LLC? Well, you always have to look at um, what we were saying earlier, like what the, th- the three main things of a corporation. So one is liability. Mm-hmm. So what is going to protect me the best from liability? And depending on the type of business that you have, you want to be you know, uh, aware of that. The second one is tax purposes. Mm -hmm. If you're a a sole LLC member, you don't really need an S Corp because it's just you. So you're basically filing your taxes for you. But if you have employees, then we get into a different thing. And and that's what he was saying, that you want to do the the S Corp because at that point you're filing under W-2 forms and you file quarterly and... It's, it's better for taxes. Yeah. The third thing that's important, too, is whether you're going to have partners or not. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you have a partner, um, an LLC can be great because you have the operating agreement and you can list what everybody's duties are going to be sure. and what's going to happen after and, you know, who has liability, who's going to pay what and whose duties is whose and all of that. Um, with the S Corp, I mean, I guess it, it it's also good for... Um, partners. But I think the main um, difference that I would say is whether you have employees or not, and whether you have partners or not. Because if you're a single member, well, you're just going to kind of be paying your taxes yourself. And a lot of people ask the question, they'll say, well, can I can I be a sole proprietor? And in certain situations, being a sole proprietor might be the best situation. And those could be situations where maybe uh, like if you're a web designer, you work out of your home exclusively, you don't go visit clients, maybe all your work is done online, 
uh, some lifestyle businesses where there's no employees, there's no people, there's no really anything involved. Some of those may be okay to be as a sole proprietor. Right. And I mean, again, we go back to liability, right? Mm -hmm. there, what is the risk? And I, you know, even when my clients ask me, well, do I need liability insurance? You know, do I need any kind of general liability insurance? We always for recommend my it. Business? I always recommend it. But I say, you know, if you're sitting at home and you don't think that you're going to do anything, mm -hmm. you know, that the, your risk of, or even if you do get sued, the amount is going to be minimal, then maybe you don't maybe want you don't to spend it. that money. Yeah. You know, maybe you don't want to do the LLC because you don't want to spend the money every year mm -hmm. if, if you don't really have a risk that you have to protect yourself. But if you're doing anything physical that you might end the up... Construction. Yeah, the you construction, know, construction. You, you know, I, I had a client tell me he they installed pools. And he says, oh, I don't need it for that. You know, we, yeah, we just do the installation do. and I'm like... Okay, imagine you're you... In you're in somebody's not, yard. Yeah, yeah, you're in somebody's yard. Imagine you hit a pipe or you hit a gas line. What if a dog you know, falls in the pool and drowns? Right, I mean, it's like so a kid... A kid, so trips anything. ...trips and falls yeah. on your equipment. I'm like, you need, you need, you need general insurance yes. for this, yeah. you know. Adriana, I have another question, and it's very coming very often to the Latin Chamber of Women. Um, many, many individuals just file online and get the LLC. They pay the business license and everything. And they say, I'm, I'm done. done, I'm covered. Yeah, I'm and all I good. Say, yeah, and I said, no, no, no. What about you operated agreement? What about this? What about your, uh, would you mean it? What you say, oh, I'm uh, uh, annual meeting. Uh, all those steps to, right. to separate the, uh, the entity from the personal side. But what did you recommend? Because... When I heard that, I said, look, you need to get an attorney. It's not good. Yes, paying, yes, get the LCC pay. It's, it's not separation between your personal liability versus the business liability. That's right. And that's what I was referring to earlier, the formalities. That's what we call following all the formalities. And the formalities are, you know, you open a separate bank account, you um, have an operating agreement, and mm -hmm. that's a big one that most people don't know about because it's not something that the um, Nevada Secretary of State has on the website. They don't talk about it. Correct. And they don't talk about it, and they don't require it. Yes. And so yes. they think, I'm done, but you're not. I just talked to somebody on uh, last week, and they were asking, they were doing it themselves. They were filing online with the Secretary of State, and I said, you need, there was a partnership, and I said, you need to consult an attorney for your operating agreement. And here's the reasons why. Why do you? Why would you recommend to consult an attorney for an operating agreement? Well, the operating agreement is like a contract um, between, and, and again, particularly if you have partners, if you have more people investing in this, mm -hmm. you want to know who invested what, what you know, what their duties are going to be. Because you don't want to be running around like crazy, like, well, we're all bosses, okay, yep. but what, what's your responsibility? What's my responsibility? And I always tell people, the more detailed information you have, the less problems you're going to have down In the, the line. In the future. The less litigation you're going to have. And this ties into um, estate planning, as we were talking about a living trust, right? Um, this is where you can stipulate in your operating agreement to say, hey, upon your death, you know, we understand your spouse is entitled to your share, but let's stipulate what that means. Right. They may be entitled to it, but, you know, they don't, maybe they don't have voting rights to anything. Right. They can't just exactly. come in and sit at the table and start running the company. And maybe this is where you designate, we're going to have some key person insurance that'll kick in, the company will pay for, and your untimely death, that monies will go to the spouse to buy out their share, and there's an automatic agreement that that's going to happen. Correct. Correct. Yes, so. you can you can put all of that language in there ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is again, it, it it's almost like doing your your trust, but for your business. It's almost like going backwards, yeah. right? Because now you're saying, okay, down the line, worst case scenario, we split up and we don't want to yeah. be in business anymore. What's going to happen? You know, well, or even if it's going great, you know, like you want to make sure that if you grow or if you want to bring in more people that you can state, okay, well, this is what he does. This is what I do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to invest, this is, this is going to be your role. I, you know, it just really, 
clarifies every everybody's role in the company and and what their rights are and yeah. investment rights and, and, and voting rights voting yeah. rights voting everything. yeah you can put in there anything you want to we're gonna have blue m ms in the office on thursdays if you right. want to right? right we're gonna we're gonna go to cancun each year for our annual uh, right. business, business meeting, meeting trip yeah. whatever it, which is it leads me to my next point about the formalities that you have to vote on things, mm-hmm. right? Like if it's just run of the mill things every day, operational thing, you don't have a vote. Like you can just um, say, okay, majority is here, but there's some that you have to have everybody vote on. Vote on. And that's like if you're going to buy a new machine, you know, it's going to cost us five hundred thousand dollars. If you're going to incur debt, what, what, what I, what, I was just going to say, if you're going to get a loan. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna take out a loan, get a credit card, incur any sort of debt in the business, put it in your operating agreement that all the partners have to agree. Right. Agree and sign. It can't and be sign. majority. It has to be but that's what the voting is. And those that's part of the formalities. And if mm-hmm. you can't show that and and you know, none of this is important until you get sued. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's all yes. fun and because games. Like, to it's like court. people can get away with it for years, and it's not going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. But the moment that you get sued and somebody wants to prove that, hey, no, this aren't two separate entities. This is the same person. Look, yep. they've been using their account. They haven't done any of the formalities. That's when it's going to become really important. Uh, to your point, always I told him, when you get sued in America, you get your company gets to you get to uh, personally and also your neighbor your dog your <laughs> bird and everybody around also the guy was passing by everybody gets to but when you show you had your company and, and you're in compliance with all formalities everybody is, is dismissed it's only the entity is responsible or whatever is the case am i correct exactly yes. and people you can be sued for anything oh yeah, oh, yeah. i was yeah. tell i was tell people i got sued uh, eight t- eight times in eight years in business. Wow. Yeah. Uh, four were legitimate. We had a problem, <laughs> and I said, "Sue the company." Then we'll work it out in court, which we did. Four of them were completely uh, frivolous lawsuits. We got named as a co-defendant with twelve other co-defendants, including the Disney Company and Donald Trump's company. How about that? <laughs> wow. And got sued out of state. And it was just like uh, we ended up settling that one because we were the low man on the totem pole, you know. Right. But. But I think what, what's really important is when it comes to the operating agreement, um, incurring debt, setting up new accounts. Yes. You know, can one partner just run out and open a bank account? What if they open a, a, an investment account? Your partner may go do a bunch of crazy stuff. And if you don't have that stipulated, they can't do it. I, I've buying had property, buying property, uh, making major purchases. So some smart things to put in your operating agreement might be uh, any, if you open an account, close an account, I've seen situations where a partner goes out and liquidates bank accounts, takes all the money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And their partner comes in and talks to me and goes, hey, Mike, I can't believe they did this. Is this right? And I said, what does your operating agreement say? Right. And they said, I don't know. Right. I don't know. Right. I said, well, the bank knows because they have a copy of it. Mm-hmm. So the bank holds a copy and says, let's see if can they really do this. If somebody comes in, oh, I'm sorry, sir. You have to have all the partners have to sign to make this happen. I recommend stuff, uh, any check over $250 and these have two signatures on it, right? right? Yeah, Some dumb stuff like that. Yes. Another thing is what's the company, what's the valuation of the company, you know? And, and one thing when we talk about estate planning is what if one of the partners gets a smoking deal? They say, you, you know, I get a call from France. Hey, Mike, we want you to come over here. We're going to pay you half a million dollars a year to go do this. See, I'll leave the partnership alone. I'm going over here, right? Um, I've, I've had situations like this happen, even my own family with siblings in a business together where one got a great job offer and they got to take it. So they take it and they leave. And the other sibling that stays there says, wait a second, I had to hire somebody to, to do what you were doing. So I should be getting more of the profits. And the other one says, well, wait, I helped build the business up though, to the point it is now. And they both have a good point, but you don't want to hash that out when that happens. You want to have it hashed out ahead of time. And so one practical thing I'd say is sit down once a year and notarize it and say, if anybody leaves or wants out of this this year, here is the, what the company is valued at presently and we'll reassess this evaluation every year. Right. So if a partner dies, if somebody gets incapacitated, the spouse comes in and goes, oh, this company's worth $5 million. You're like, no, it's worth a million. Sorry. We all agreed to it. And so that's the amount. It, it, makes, it makes your job a lot easier on the back end, right, as an attorney. When you see it, you're like, okay, this is pretty cut and dry. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, I mean, it's better for the client because they're not going to be tied up in litigation trying to 
figure out what it's worth and what they should get and what they should do. It's exactly. already it's already spelled out. Yeah, so the message is that they need to have the formalities to understand that separates the entity for the personal side. Because believe me, it's very often uh, at the chamber, uh, people give me a call, oh, I have an ALCC, they give us a call. Okay, what is the operating agreement? And also we do for certification for minority-owned, women-owned businesses. And they say, what? What are you talking about? I pay my taxes and I pay mm -hmm. my registration. It's not enough. I need, we need your operating agreement, the shares of the partnership, who was the partner, and then the percentage, because you need to be 51% owned, minority-owned, and American citizen or permanent legal resident. Otherwise, you cannot qualify, and that's the troubles we have. Yeah. The other thing um, that's interesting is with um, spouses, you know, sometimes people just add their husband as a member of mm -hmm. the LLC, and the husband has never had anything to do with it. Exactly. And on the operating agreement, they put him as, you know, 50% owner, and then they get divorced, and the wife says, well, he never did anything on my company. This happened to one of my clients. So he never had nothing to do with it. Well, it says right here that he's half He's He's right you know? in there. And so now I always tell my clients, you know, before you just start putting your spouse, you know, as a member, and, and you put him, or even if you do want to put him as a member, but at least specify on the operating agreement that they have no ownership. Exactly. If they really don't, you know. And, and then that can also protect you for the, you know, community property because you've already, and he agreed that you don't have ownership of this. Th that's a very good point because a lot of times I think spouses want to be on part of the business or, you know, or they say, hey, I want my spouse to be on this business. Because it's a community property state that we live in, you don't even have to do that at all. I mean, because in your case of your death, they're your, they're your heir anyway, right? right? Case of divorce, they still get half whether they're on the business or not. So anyway, that, that, that's correct, right? You just, right. You, you don't have to have them involved in it. And sometimes that's, that's a little better off. I've seen people that say, I'm putting my wife on the business because it'll look like it's a female owned business and we'll get more contracts that way. And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> no, that's not necessarily the case. Right. They have to be materially participate in the business and be part of it. And it's great. You want to put them on the paperwork, but um, that can lead to a lot of problems. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So what else have we got for business planning? What else do you recommend, counselor? Um, well, I definitely recommend um, succession planning. I think we we touched a little bit about mm -hmm. that, but who you know, um, particularly if you, if it isn't a partnership, if you if it's only you, do you want your kids to continue the business, or how is how is this going to happen? You know, is your family going to carry your torch, mm -hmm. or is it going to wind down? Yep. You know? And, and I think that's important for a person to say when there's partners, um, they're going to have to decide, you know, as as, uh, as a group what they want to happen with a company, like we said earlier. Exactly. In, in the demise of one person or the other. Um, but definitely, you know, succession planning for um, a single um, LLC or a family owned business is really important. Yeah to do I, actually banks uh, when you get loans uh, especially you're getting bigger like a million or plus a million dollars uh, also the banks uh, always they require, they require the cessation plan in order in place uh, in order to get the loan yeah just in case they want to they want to see who's going to run the ship in case you're out of the picture exactly. you know because each key person in the business is is worth is worth a lot right and, and it's it's to be mentioned too that um if you are planning on, I mean, there's cases with, uh, I, I've seen cases where there's been family owned businesses that maybe a father did very well. He has, he has several daughters. He's concerned that uh, the, the kids all owned the company, essentially, all the shares of stock. But uh, when they got married, right. it transferred back to the father because he did, he says, I don't want a son in law to come in and divorce my daughter and take part of the company like that. And so that's kind of how they structure it. You can do some really interesting things with the state planning to make this all happen. So, yeah. yes. And then the other thing I do, I also want to add to the formalities and um, just how to protect your business. Um, make sure that you're in compliance with all uh, state laws, um, 
all, get all your licenses. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes people don't realize that depending on what side of town you are, you could you might need a, a county license versus a city license. And then if you have um, if you have a business in both, you might need both licenses. Um, do you need anything specialized? You know, like if you're a massage therapist, they're going to need different type of licensing, yeah. you know. Um, so those kinds of things, you know, to be aware of. Uh, insurance is a really important one, too. Um, I've had clients who have employees and didn't have workers' comp. Now, workers' comp is not its not just going to be the liability that you have to pay. It's going to be the state coming the after state, you for yep. not having workers' comp. And yep. that happened to a client of mine where he was going to get fined $50,000 for Ouch. not having that. Not now, it. we were able to negotiate it, and he paid the lower <laughs> amount of Fifteen thousand dollars, but it's still a lot of money. That if he would have just been paying workers' comp insurance, but the it's be right. people need to understand this mandatory. If uh, they are it's sole mandatory. proprietor and they are the only ones working for the company, uh, they have the exception. But if, if uh, let's like say, a cleaning company, if his son or his wife is working, they is mandatory to have the workers' comp. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Well, we had a great discussion today. Um, definitely money well spent legally. I, I know a lot of a lot of people get a little freaked out about spending money for attorneys. This is one of the areas you really should do this, right? right. Um, it's not that expensive, and it protects you in the long run. So thank you, Adriana, for being with us today. You're welcome. Um, thank and, you for having me. And thank you, Carlos, for being here with us again. Thank you. Uh, as well. Once again, this is the Biz Life Podcast uh, coming to you from you and our extension offices. In lovely Las Vegas, Nevada, we're the Small Business Education Program. My name is Mike Bindrup. Thanks for being with us here today. And go do something great in your business today. Thank you.